And this is something I've been kind of kicking around in my head for like 10 some odd years. It's like maybe the sequencing, maybe we do some high rep, high volume stuff early on, build those energetic pathways, build some capillaries. And this isn't even new. Perillo was talking about this 20 years ago. Vince Garanda was talking about it even longer, longer ago than that. We increased the cell's ability to not only generate ATP and fuel to bring in nutrients, find some way to increase ribosome number and training in itself tends to do that. So maybe we do high volume to build up those components. We follow that up with the actual tension training to build, to stimulate the actual myofibril growth. Well, we're right back to volume, volume into intensity, right? This is, again, I've invented nothing new. Most, that's most of my career. I just, re I refine, I refine old concepts. So we might, it might be that. It could just be that this nature of training just develops that, you, you know, and, and they, they proposed this. And I really want to see this paper. They said maybe there's a difference. Maybe high volume training like, you know, 32 sets of submaximal 10 or even the low load stuff. Maybe that's preferentially building the sarcoplasm and heavy sets of three to five are preferentially building the, the contractile components. Because all these studies that are like, oh, the growth is the same. Mm -hmm. All they're measuring is just the overall growth. They're not looking at right. the individual components because that's a lot more difficult. It's a lot more of a pain in the ass. But the low load stuff we know doesn't increase strength to the same degree. Now, I always assumed it was neurological, right? We know there's a neural component to training and maybe they're just not going, but they proposed, well, possibly, maybe they're just, maybe this type of training isn't developing the contractile components. And this study comparing bodybuilders, strength, power athletes basically said that. So their specific tension, their force production per unit fiber diameter, the bodybuilders were not only lower than the strength power athletes, but I believe it was lower than the untrained in a relative sense, mm -hmm. right? Because and basically what they concluded, they actually concluded hypertrophy is detrimental to strength, which I think is <laughs> maybe pushing it, but maybe there's, may, you know, and maybe there was drugs involved. Maybe it was the nature of, but it may be that fatigue training is building the sarcoplasm primarily and heavy training and you know, real training is building which then we come back to as always my generic bulking routine that combines both right mm -hmm. bodybuilding for 50 years if you look at all effective training programs what does it combine heavy tension and some element of fatigue you look at power building five sets of five followed by four sets of 15 it's an old thing in this book i had one time and you did a heavy set of six straight into a heavy set of 20 just like a super set Right. Like if you look back at essentially, I mean, things got really confused when drugs, because drugs will make you grow no matter what you do. Drugs will make you grow without training. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to hear that either. And you're well aware of that. Yep. So, but if you look back at without all of that, that confused the issue, all effective training programs for naturals, they have a tension component and they have a fatigue component. And maybe that's the way you build both simultaneously. Or, but again, we got off the individual differences thing. What, what I do think we may find down the road is, A, maybe the ability to identify limiters, which means targeting your weak point. Like, we can do that in endurance training. Mm -hmm. Is your endurance good or is your top speed good? Is your lactate? Like, it's super easy to test that stuff. Well, you, then you work on whatever's limiting you. In the weight room, well, in powerlifting and Olympic lifting, it's a lot easier. Figure out where the weak point is. But in bodybuilding, when you're dealing with deep muscle physiology, it's a big black box right now. All we know is yeah. that training hopefully leads to growth. And in the middle, magic happens. And we can't really <laughs> identify, like, I don't know how you would identify in a biological sense what any individual's limiting factor might be to adjust their training. Well, don't you think, and this is something I was talking with Brian Haycock uh, recently about. Oh, so, and he, I had for years. Yeah, yeah, he's old school, so people don't know. Um, you know, he was he kind of got on the scene with HST, hypertrophy specific training. That's what he's most well known for. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, he and Eric Combs was talking about him how he really had a lot of the concepts that we talk about today. You know, a decade prior to you know when oh, they yeah. really popularized. And something that he and I agreed on is, and I imagine you would agree on this as well, is you know when we're, we're talking about you could go about it this way or that way or the other, it's maybe going to get you to that max size a little faster but yeah. it's probably not going to get you bigger than you otherwise would have gotten you know maybe it'll take oh, you five years instead of seven years or something like yeah. that yeah oh no and i agree with that completely like at the end of the day you're going to reach a genetic limit no matter what you do now i i think you know again people tend to mishear the genetic limit thing most people probably won't get to their genetic limit 
for whatever reason, bad nutrition, training inconsistency, like whatever it is, that in no way denies that there is a limit. Sure. Right? We know, for example, that height is genetic. Now, in a lot of cultures, you can do a lot of things to prevent you from reaching your maximum height. Poor nutrition, things of that nature, like they're seeing, I believe, in Japan, where their diet is improving. Well, not improving, it's just becoming more Western. They're basically gaining fat sooner and eating more calories because America. And there's an average increase in height. Because, and it's not that their genetics have changed, it's that they're now being allowed to reach their genetic maximum. Right. And muscle growth is certainly the same. Everyone is going to have an individual genetic limit. There is, you know, I wrote that other, the, the newest tedious series on fat-free mass index, which is not an absolute, but you know what? When 98% of people aren't getting past it, it might as well be. Like, right, realistically, right. most people are not going to get far past that as a natural. Um and I, you know, it's, yes, it's not an absolute, I, I changed, you know, I, back in the day, 15 years ago, I was a little more, but it's like, no, some people clearly get past it. But when you've got six of like the top pro natural bodybuilders only getting past it, right, these are the best of the best. You're not them. You're not going to get past it. It might as well be it. But so whatever, but there is a genetic limit. It is a matter of the end of the day, how quickly or not you get there, or if you do get there, right? There's a lot of people in every gym who've been toiling away for a decade with nothing to show for it. There's a lot of people who are at their limit that are still toiling away for 10 years that are not ever going to get any bigger, no matter what they do. Um, HST was sort of like, Brian Brian's a friend. I knew him for years online. I at one point tried, I tried desperately. I go, dude, let me help you write this book because it's never getting done otherwise. And it wasn't the right time or place. And we are still here 15 years later and the HST book will never exist. And it's a shame. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, the, pro, the system, a, a, for people that aren't aware of what hypertrophy specific training, it's exactly what it, what it sounds like. He was big into higher frequency. You typically train the muscle group three times a week, which is not, you know, based on gene expression and protein synthesis and this and that and the other. You typically cycled repetitions every two weeks from higher to lower, did like, 15s, 12s, 10s, 8s, I think 5s, and then two weeks of eccentrics if you could do it. Then you took a couple weeks off and you did it all over again. And the goal was that over each two weeks, you would work up, the weights would go up each time. So we had progressive tension overload, usually hitting a max on the sixth workout. And then you would move to the next rep range and you would do the same thing. So basically, the weights were increasing as the volume came down a little bit. So what, what was I just saying? We go from volume to intensity. This is how people have trained since the 60s. The eccentrics were a pain to do because you need training partners. I disagree with them completely about strategic deconditioning because the repeated yeah. bout effect doesn't go away, but neither here nor there, right? I My programs, I have two sub-maximal weeks to build back. Whatever. You got to give your body a little bit of a break. Mm -hmm. He was ahead of his time in many ways. I predicted, and I think this is why it never truly caught on. I said, dude, here's what you're going to, the problem you're going to run into. You're telling bodybuilders to spend five out of every six workouts working submaximally. Right. And yep. they're not and they're not gonna do it. And he goes, I think you're wrong. And I said, I know I'm right. And I was <laughs> right. Because yeah. that is something that bodybuilders, especially younger, don't want to hear and don't want to do. Um, and you know, and 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 that's the reality. You know, we've got frequency, volume, intensity, pick two. Right. And, right. and in a way, and I wrote, there's an article on my website, I think general mass building something. And it's basically like I looked at several different programs, you know, the hammer it once a week, hypertrophy specific training, my own tr approach to training. And it's like pick two. Brian chose frequency and volume to a degree. And the intensity was on average lesser because the individual workouts were submaximal, except for the one workout every every sixth workout. The one one. The you know the hammer it one day a week for twenty sets you're doing, you're basically sacrificing frequency to do volume and in premise intensity and then I tend to take the middle ground with my generic bulking routine as I call it and you train twice a week at a pretty pretty high intensity you start sub maximally and then you push pretty hard for six weeks, Dante Trudell with dog crap similar right two weeks of cruising and then six weeks of really just trying to kill yourself and beat your records. But if you kind of look at all these successful programs, it's some combination of those. But the general premise is you get stronger over time. And right. this is unfortunately, without going off on this rant, 
right now there's this idea in the industry that volume is the primary driver on growth and it's wrong i know where it's coming from i know where the inference i know where the logic is coming from and i will laugh smugly as i always do in several years when people realize that they went down the wrong road because all the studies they're basing this on right like brad's seven by three versus three by ten and all these other studies they are working on a base of progressive tension overload. There is always sufficient intensity, well, mostly, and the weights are being increased as the lifters get stronger. Volume adds on to that, mm -hmm. right? When you take a study, and, 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 and again, we haven't really done the correct comparison to really test this. I think the study Mike Isertel was involved with does kind of point to that because so that, that eight-week Brad Schoenfeld study on internal and external growth saw like a five millimeter, millimeter increase in the biceps in eight weeks. The study Mike was involved in saw like 1.8 in six weeks with a ton of low-intensity volume. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, intensity trumps volume. It does. Now, intensity plus volume may give a better result up to a point. I'm not saying that's like, and that's my analysis, 10 to 20 hard sets. But if you're not getting stronger over time, and I don't mean every workout, I don't mean every week, I don't even mean every month, right? Everyone's like, you can't add weight to the bar forever. No, you can't. But by the time you can't add weight to the bar, you're not getting any bigger. Bad news. I was going to say, you're done anyway, right? Right. If you look at all the big naturals, they're all strong. Dave Gooden, who I spoke about, he's a beast. I've watched him squat over 500 pounds. I've watched him deadlift enormous weights. Now, that was 20 years of my own training partner, who was 5'5 five, five and 220. It's built like a, a freaking – oh, he's – I mean, he wasn't in shape at that. He competed in the high 190s, but he looked like so, – uh, he looked like Ed Cohn, right? He looked like just take a 220 guy and squish him, squish right. you to 5'5, five, five and you just – <laughs> he was it was amazing. I watched him pull 500, squat 405, do 315 for 20. He wasn't a fantastic bencher just because of his arms because he was a great puller. But, like, if you look at all the, the, the big naturals, over time they have added weight. Now, again, within, yes, whatever frequency, whatever volume. And I think you're right. Brian structured that one way. I structured it another. Dante... Trudell, I believe, was the one to put it the most succinctly. He said, growth comes from making strength gains in a moderate repetition range. Yep. And I can't put it any better than that. Because a lot of people, when I've said, oh, it's progressive tension overload, it's like, well, then why aren't the strongest guys the biggest? Because I'm not talking about 1RMs. I'm not talking right. about neurological. I'm not talking about levers. I'm not talking, and I'm not comparing individuals. I'm not saying a guy with a foreigner bench will necessarily be bigger, like you said. I mean, there was a point even at like 155, I could out dumbbell incline press much bigger guys in my gym. Mm -hmm. Like for whatever reason, I got strong and efficient with my big monkey arms, but I didn't. And maybe it was a lack of volume. Maybe I needed more volume on top of, of, of the intensity. But if you take a guy who's benching 225 for eight and a year he's benching 315 for eight, yep. he's going to be bigger, right? And then people argue, oh, but it's the muscle size increase that lets him put the weight on the bar, not the putting the weight on the bar that I go, okay, where does the circle start? Right. right? You add weight, eventually you grow, you can add more weight. And then, okay, where, where are we, where's the loop start? It, it's ultimately a non-issue because I can guarantee you that if you just put 225 on the bar, you can add a set every week for the rest of your damn life. Mm -hmm. And you won't grow. You'll grow for a little while. You, you will get a growth response for a little bit. But why not? Why not five sets, 10 sets, 20 sets? Do 100 sets. Won't work. And that's yeah. a setting I would like to see done. I would like to see them take two sets of people, put them on whatever, some moderate amount of training volume, whatever, five sets twice a week. Like pick something right there in the middle range. Okay, have one group, stay there, and add weight over time. 12 mm -hmm. weeks, whatever it is. Have the other group, keep the weight the same, add sets over time, whatever. Try to match the tonnage or the volume load or whatever you want to do. See what happens. Yeah. And if it says that volume gets more growth than intensity, I'll be the first one to say I was wrong. But mm -hmm. I know I'm not because it just doesn't work that way. And you can go into any gym in any city and in this country and the world probably and see that it doesn't work because yeah it's funny i was going to use the same same example yeah. there i was gonna, you know if you take two twins 135 for 10 each you know if the one goes to 315 for 10 over however many years i don't care how many sets you do with 135 sure. or even if you increase the reps i mean it's just it's never going to sure. be 
the same, you know, and I think um, Dante, he says like that heavy slag iron is, is his quote he uses. And he's right. You know, you just don't see even for me and I'm sure you too, we might have been stronger than our size might indicate, but it was still the same principles apply. When I put 20 pounds on my bench, my pecs sure. are a little bigger, you know, it's right. still it's just, Yes. It's about prog that progression over time because, and, and that is again, you know, we've, and it's funny because even the people that are now saying volume is the primary driver, if you look at the other papers they've written, they go, yeah, attention is the primary initiator of growth. And, and it is. Like we even we're finding out why. We're finding that high tension contractions activate mTOR, through, I want to say phosphatidic, and none of this matters to anybody listening. This is a bunch of nerdy molecular level crap that is of no relevance whatsoever, right? Because the, the point, and, and it's funny, they, there's some really interesting groups doing that have done this work. And one group did, they had people just do one all-out repetition every day for three weeks with one arm, right? No growth. I wouldn't have expected it to be. I actually got into an argument with an HST guy 10, 15 years ago. And he went from tension as the primary stimulus of growth to tension is the only. And I said, okay, then why not just do a one RM? And right. he goes, well, what do you mean? I go, you can do that one set of one, one RM every day. That will be the maximum tension that your muscle will experience and you won't grow. You need sufficient volume on top of that. And so, yeah, so we know, you know, we know all that we know that, the tension eventually does this, but doing one hard rep isn't enough. And actually right. what they what they did, it was really cool. I think I'm not confusing studies. They did it with one arm. They did that one RM 21 days in a row. But the other arm, they had to do like three sets of eight, like not even a really heavy volume. The volume and, and that three with, I mean, like to failure or whatever they did, or maybe they did one RM and followed by the three A, whatever it was, and they grew, right? So you need sufficient tension for a sufficient number of contractions. Mm -hmm. What we don't know yet is how many you need for optimal results. And this is another study I would like to see done because I think, in pre, like, I know, I get it. Lyle, Lyle, science is hard. I know that. I'm aware that science is hard. That doesn't mean you should do crap, right? Like, I get it. I, it's, it's hard and it's expensive, and maybe you should go pick an easier career if you can't work that out. Like, I'm sorry. Writing a book is hard, too, but somehow I've managed to do it a few times. But what I would like to see, right, is, and this is something Dante has said, his goal with dog crap, and for people who don't know, it's basically a rest pause similar to bla a, a Blade Fagerly's. Uh, blood, thank you, board, yeah. Uh, his myo reps conceptually, right, is you do a set to failure, take three or four big breaths, do two or three reps, take big three, do two or three reps, and then you rotate exercise, and there's a little more to it, and over time, like, your goal is to beat, you know, to beat your workout card. And honestly, I think that was a big part of, of, of dog crap, right? There's a lot of good things in there, the loaded stretching and whatever, whatever, but he, he got into guys' heads and said, look, guys, you've got to add weight over time. That's why they grew because they weren't. They were focusing on the squeeze and the pump and the this and the that. And it's just like, no, you've got, and that's what got them growing and eating enough. Anyway, what I would like to see, and oh, and his point was, I want to give the greatest muscle growth stimulus with the least amount of fatigue that cuts into recovery. And I think that's really something that we don't consider, right? So we know that, okay, you do one set. You don't get very tired. Maybe you stimulate half of your maximal growth potential. And these are made up numbers. So you go to three sets. You're going to generate more fatigue and potentially muscle breakdown, which doesn't get measured because it's hard. Maybe you get 75%. Maybe at six sets, you get 90%. But with each incremental increase, you're also getting more fatigue. And what I would really like to see done, and there's only one study and it compared one set to three sets, which is not sufficient. Compared one set to failure to three sets is by Bird et al., B-U-R-D. And the three-set group, muscle protein synthesis was turned on to a greater degree. Aha, volume. Well, but three versus one doesn't tell us a hell of a lot. I want to know where the threshold is, right? Bring guys in, have them do one set with their right arm and three sets with their left arm. Do all the tracer stuff, see what happens. Now do six and nine, 12 and 15, Ideally measure muscle protein breakdown. And that's a real bear technically, which is why they don't do it. But whatever, what I want to see, because logically at some point, more sets does not stimulate more growth. Right. 
right? There will be, and, and I'm told, and I have not seen it, that uh, James Krieger has supposedly done an analysis showing that, oh, eight to 10 sets per workout is about the most, this, and I know there was some variance, I suppose, but of course I see that. Huh, so now you're saying 10 sets per workout, but you're still defending the 15. Never mind. Moving on. Uh, I've said enough. But I see that people in this industry like to just hope nobody. People have very short-term memory. They're like, oh, what I'm talking about now contradicts the argument I made six months ago. Let's hope nobody notices. And then I'm like, I notice. <laughs> well, I will always notice. I will. I got. I got spies <laughs> everywhere. Anyway, so I, I suspect. I mean, there has to be right. Otherwise, why not? do the HIT thing. They always argue, well, if you're going to do more than one set, why don't you do five or 20 or 100? Well, mm -hmm. that's dumb. That's a dumb argument. But, or ideally see, okay, let's say as we go up from, you know, one to three to five to 10 sets, maybe muscle protein breakdown eventually is going up linearly and then goes up back. Or I mean, who knows? I would like to see, is there a threshold? What is the threshold? Is there an optimal in terms of return on investment? That sort of thing, right? If you go back to the old worm bomb analysis that everybody likes to crap on now, and I realize it was limited by the data of the day, but he's like, all right, 10 reps will get you a little growth. 20, 30, 40 to 70 seem to be about optimal, you know? And if you math that out across rational set counts, it's about eight to seven sets per workout. I mean, there's a reason we keep coming back to these numbers. And above 80, it goes back down. Because at some point, you overwhelm your recovery ability. This recent paper by Barbalho on women that I'm still trying to get written up, right? It's really shocking because it suggested that like five sets a week gave the same gains as 10, but most importantly, 15 and 20 gave worse results. And this kind of throws a wrench. Now, admittedly, it's in women. It's the only study in women on this topic so far. They also used a kind of, you know, they trained each muscle group once a week, and their workout was stupid as hell. It's not even worth getting into. The way they, so they were like five sets per workout, but the up the, the push workout was two sets for chest press, two sets for incline, and one set for shoulder press. Who the hell counts sets this way? Like, right. who counts five sets? The back workout was two sets of rows, two sets of pull downs, and one set of upright rows. You can't, you can't count sets per workout, right? And then the lower body workout was squat, leg press, and stiff like a deadlift. What? Anyway, once a week, but they cycled the intensity, right? They did like 12 to 15 RM, but they, there were some workouts that were like four to six rep max. So imagine, right, doing squats, like the high volume group, the 20 set group, which was doing like, Oh, I want to say, let's see, one, two, four, is like eh, seven, seven, and six, right? Seven sets of squat, seven sets of leg press, six, right? They're doing seven, 14 sets of four to six RM in a workout. Of course they got poor results. What, mm -hmm. human, being, what human being could survive that? I couldn't yeah. do it. You couldn't do it. No power. I mean, and they weren't used to low reps either. My point only being, now what I would have liked to see them done, split the workout up. Like maybe 10 sets twice a week, right? So it's only seven sets of four to six. That's maybe humanly accomplishable. But whatever, neither here nor there. My point with the growth thing is eventually I want to see the data. How many total contractions or how many sets or what volume eventually gives us the maximal increase in protein synthesis before it either flattens out completely, flattens out to such a point that it's not worth doing more sets, or possibly starts decreasing again. Yeah. And I think until we have this, this data, and like I said, in premise, it doesn't seem like a hard study. Technically, it would be a very hard study to do. Um, but I think it would go a long way towards figuring out, like, going forwards. Right now, they're just throwing random set counts at these studies, right? And the way they're setting them up, it's like, well, we picked X number of exercises, and we decided to do one, three, or five sets. And it worked out to a billion sets, but how many per effective effective sets per muscle group, right? Like, and maybe even in going back to this thing, right? The the Schoenfeld volume study was all compounds except for leg extensions, mm -hmm. right? It was all it was like chest press and incline press, whatever it was. The internal external focus study did bicep curls and leg extensions. So that those sets mm -hmm. all count directly. That was twelve right. sets for biceps. I'm not going to count. 30 sets of rows and pull downs as 30 sets for biceps because it doesn't work out that way. Maybe 15, 
And at that point, the numbers, and even so, the 12 heavy sets still got better growth. But it was, yeah. so, so isolation versus compound, they're, they're just picking these kind of random workouts and random set counts to go, oh, so now the, like the leg line was 9, 27, and 45. What the hell happens in between those? Like, don't set it sets per exercise. Set a rational number of sets per muscle group. Go, we want to compare 10, 15, and 20 sets per muscle group. Now let's adjust the set count in, a, in an intelligent way to achieve that. Because right. just, set, just a set count across each exercise doesn't make much sense to me. So I think, I think there's some work to be done there to find those, those criteria and endpoints. And historically, you know, almost all of these studies have been done in men. And I would imagine a lot of the same principles apply to women, but I think we've sure. been finding that maybe women can handle a higher workload. So that, that's something I wanted to ask you. I know you have a pretty yeah. high level female athlete you're training. So what differences yeah. are you, you noticing with female physiology compared to men in terms of, you know, this endeavor? Yeah, and, I, and, and like I said, this Barbalho study is interesting, but it is, it's the first paper. And I, I, again, I will be doing a, a much more thorough analysis to really compare this. Women more so than men, I think, should train at a higher frequency, right? Like, now, if you go back to 20-year-old me or 25-year-old me, who I wish I could go back and punch in the face, right, I was adamantly against the training each muscle group once per week. Thing is, it, it clearly can and does work for some people. I don't think it's optimal for most, neither here nor there. It can work. I think for women, it's going to be totally ineffective because women, we know, do recover more quickly under certain conditions. Um, and there's a number of reasons, like it's clearly biological in the sense that it is a sex-based difference. However, much of it may simply be doing, women generate less fatigue because they're lifting lower absolute loads. And that is a big, like that is a super big part of it, right? Even in powerlifting, a woman squatting 200 is not generating the fatigue of a guy squatting 600. Now, now, people, now you might argue, but they're both 95%. Yeah, but any coach will tell you it's not the same. Right. These guys uh, who are squatting, you know, eight, nine hundred pounds. I don't care if that's only 85 percent or whatever ridiculous number it is. That is a much larger systemic stress than a woman squatting one fifth of that. And I think and that's where I think the Barbalho study did go wrong. It put all the volume on one day. I would like the follow up to be, well, let's split the volume and I bet the results will be better. But what I think most coaches have found empirically, and actually there's a powerlifting coach. Hanny, I will never pronounce his last name correctly. I was listening to a podcast by him, and he's got, he's like, all right, men, squat twice a week, bench three times a week, deadlift once a week, women, add one. And I think most coaches who are in tune with that, uh, guys like Matt Gary, and and would probably agree with that, that when bench press more so than, than all others, because for a lot of women, you know, let's face it, a body weight bench is huge for a lot of them. Right. Yep. 135. I mean, if, if again, we're obviously body weight plays a role here, but, you know, a 135 bench by and large is a really major accomplishment for most women. And if you don't believe me, go to any non elite powerlifting gym. Right. Like, don't. Oh, I hang out with elite. I don't care. Go look at the 99 percent of women who are maybe benching 75 pounds. Right. And struggling with it. Um, that was actually the other thing with the Barbalho study. They described them as having trained for three years. And their bench press max came out to like 90 pounds, was like total beginner levels. Like, mm -hmm. I don't care that they had three years of training experience. Because and, and OK, they added 50 percent to their strength in six months. That's not a trained individual. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think right. I think the other reason they got the results they did was that in beginners, you don't need a lot of volume. And again, 14 sets of four to six RM would kill anybody, much less a relative beginner to low. Anyway, is. Uh, yeah, you know, women may be squatting. I mean, again, I'm not talking about like the elite exceptions. Like I know we've got Jen Thompson benching 350. She's an outlier. We have at least one or two female powerlifters who are pulling over 600. I know at least one who's getting close to that. Um, you know, there's women squatting in the threes and fours and usually with great levers and, you know, heavier body weights. But by and large, female powerlifters or, or trainees, they're just not lifting the poundages. And they do recover more quickly physiologically. Again, whether it's inherent hormonally or just a function of lifting lighter loads, I, I can't really say. But in practice, they always are. 
I mean, I, okay, yeah. somebody somebody's gonna send me a nasty PM. Go, uh, uh, like I, I would love to hear the women who are who are deadlifting six hundred are probably training proportionally closer to the way men train. Mm -hmm. But most women aren't deadlifting six hundred. Let's just face it. You know, my right. my my lifter who's you know one fourteen. She's she's max two fifteen squat in the gym. She's benched one fifty six. Her deadlift is her big lift. She's pulled over 315 in a meet. I mean, she's done triple body weight deadlift. But even so, she can still pull relatively heavy two or three times a week and, and get away with that, whereas that would just destroy destroy a man. Yeah. Um, so, 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 yeah, frequency tends to be higher. One thing I'm seeing, and I've heard several female athletes, uh, there's one female powerlifter who's also a researcher, Megan, forget her last name, and, you know, she tried to fought, to follow kind of the men's templates, and it wasn't working for her. And she right. found she needed to insert more, you know, 90% work to really get the most out of her training. And I think there's a few things going on. Uh, I know Eric Helms has said women take lo take a few years to be able to express their a true 1RM. And I don't know mm -hmm. if that's neurological, psychological, physiological, but it doesn't matter in practice. It's a function of if a woman is... At, if her one RM right now is 90% of her true max and you put her at 85% of that, she's lifting at 70% and that's not a training load. The guy lifting right. at 80 85% is at 80 to 85%. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, every competition cycle, you know, Sumi will generally, she'll train, you know, heavy days and, and she can, she can repeat at 90% singles at 90% all day, every day. Like she can just do six, seven, eight reps at that. And with like a 90 second rest, she recovers super. And, and that would kill most guys, right? Yeah. Most guys do a heavy set of squats and I got to go lay down for five or 10 minutes. Women are ready to go in a couple minutes. So I think she, she benefits from from a higher relative intensity along with the volume work. This actually goes back to what we were talking about, about the hypertrophy thing, kind of about like, what are you bad at? Like, what's your weak point? And I think what women have better volume tolerance. Hmm. Men can generate more intensity. And again, whether it's absolute or relative, I can't, they're different. There are neurological differences, a lot going on. Lower body and upper body are different, yada, yada, yada. Wait for volume two uh, whenever it gets done. Regardless, um, because women can do a lot of volume, they can not only tolerate higher relative intensities, but they may need it because that's what they're not, their systems aren't as good at. And it just doesn't kill them as much. Mm -hmm. Whereas men who are better able to generate intensity seem to do better. I'm seeing a lot of guys, Mike Tushare, I just heard talk about this. He's like, yeah. Guys are doing a little bit better, staying in the eight, eight and a half RPE range. You know, that's probably 80, 85% of your best at that given, somewhere in there. You know, a rep or two in the tank and doing a little bit more volume because that's what they're bad at. Part of this came out of a conversation, you know, Broderick Chavez? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's a buddy of mine. And we talked about this. Uh, I interviewed him on his own podcast about steroids. And I was like, all right, how would you have people change? And he goes, well, for men who take drugs, they should just do more volume. They can already generate intensity, and if they try to generate more, they get hurt. Mm -hmm. Because, however, women can already do a ton of volume. Anabolics will let them work at a higher intensity, and that's where they'll get their growth. And this is, I'm sure it's hormonal. I'm sure it's, and I'm sure it's androgens and its effect in either the nervous system or the muscle. Estrogen effects like muscle contractility. There's all kinds of stuff going on that's different. But when you put women on anabolic steroids, you can train them more like men, just like Coaches that have coached women with like polycystic ovary syndrome, that typically they can have 30, they can, have, they can have double the testosterone, normal testosterone level at the extremes. They train way more like men. They've shown that women with higher testosterone choose more intense workouts, are more competitive, like they are more wired kind of biologically like. And so it's, it's clearly an androgen thing with estrogen probably playing a role here. But female powerlifters can go more frequently and probably should. I mean, they could probably, I, there's one funny paper compared recovery, heavy bench press, men and women. It said the women were recovered after four hours. Now, I don't believe that because <laughs> I think that's a little ridiculous. But when you look at that stuff, typically women will recover much, much more rapidly or certainly more rapidly than men from the same load.
how are they measuring recovery? I, usually it's it's not, you know, usually they'll do something like they'll test their maximal voluntary, maximal isometric yeah. or torque output. And then and a paper just came out that said, nope, that's not, a, you have to test specifically like fatigue in one domain doesn't cause fatigue in the other. And, you know, that that's always a problematic with this. But yeah. it is, it's just the nature of the technology. And like I said, four hours seems a bit excessive to me, but I've seen stuff men generate more central fatigue, right? Neuro basically what's going on in the brain. Women just don't. They generate more peripheral fatigue. And that's because just the loads aren't as heavy. And so it's it's men's systems are sort of trying to shut the system down a little. So so there's a number of differences. And I do think it comes down to women can train more frequently per week at a higher average intensity. Um, this Hanny, it's going to kill me that I can't remember his last name, starts with a J and it's not easy to pronounce. Anyway, he said, you know what? I don't even taper most women. And I barely taper my athlete because she doesn't need it. The guy squatting 800 is beaten up, right? He's tired. He may do his last deadlift two weeks out. I mean, the West Side guys were taking damn near three weeks off, but they're beaten up all year round. My lifter, she'll do a near max, she'll do a max workout seven days out. I'll take her to her third attempts on Monday, Tuesday, her second attempts on her priming workout, because if she doesn't do that, she loses touch with heavy weight. Like I cut her volume by like two reps. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's barely a taper because women, and again, at the higher levels, I, I would love to hear what the folks pulling, women pulling 600 do. I'm sure yeah. it's more similar to men, certainly, um, but they're probably taper. I talked to the guys, uh, Will Berkman and Alex, something on weekly weights out of Australia, and they were like, yeah, you know, with our lighter men and our women, you know, the lighter men may pull last heavy deadlift. Oh, 10 days out, the women seven, the bigger men two weeks out. It's like they kind of scale up by, by overall strength and, and body size. Um and just to kind of finish that up, I think probably the most systematic data on this comes from the Chinese female Olympic lifters. Because, the Ch I mean, the Chinese are currently dominating Olympic lifting. And yeah. realize it is a different sport. It's more elastic. It's more explosive. It's not power lifting. But what they're doing is very similar. And what they typically find is that, A, women can do more sets at 90% than men. Now, it's not a huge – we're talking like five versus eight, right? We're not talking triple – um, I think Mike and I both sort of, as a rough rule of thumb, eh, women can probably handle maybe 30% more volume. Like, we're not talking doubling it. We're talking two or three more sets just because they – and they might need shorter rest periods to generate – they just don't generate the same fatigue, right? Have a woman do a damn near set of limit squats of 15 reps. In 90 seconds, she's ready to go again. Yeah. Now, have a, now have a man do it. He'll have to lay down for 10 minutes. Right. It's just so, so 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 with the Chinese females, they they can do they do more sets at 90 percent, often more reps, and they will train heavily for three weeks and the men will only train heavily for two before they need a deload. And, and I think and like and again, Olympic lifting is a little bit different. Women can use that lower body elasticity they've got um, another coach. I know. Right. Uh, Olympic lifters frequently get caught at the bottom. Right in the, in the the clean recovery, and what they'll do is they'll stand up a little bit and bounce and try to catch a rebound. And what this coach friend of mine said that like with the men, they get one shot at that. They try to stand up and catch a bounce. If they don't get it, they're done. It's like mm -hmm. the women; they'll try three, four, five times. Yeah. And, and again, some of it, they are women are more elastic, but they're just lifting roughly twenty five percent lower loads at, 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 at any body weight class. And it's just yeah. you add you add all those factors together, and it basically allows them to get away. and And they probably need it because they need they need that higher intensity. So I think that would be the big the big implications. Um, you know, I, I still think progressive overload is important, even for women. I think that's a big, and you see that all the time online, right? Women basically faff about to use a UK term with lightweights because what's her name said don't lift more than three pounds or you get bulky. Uh, whoever that celebrity trainer is. Who, so. I don't know. And some celebrity trainer told women, never lift more than three pounds or you get bulky. And you go, really? you know, if, you have a, if you have a baby, let me know how that works out for you. Because <laughs> um, that one starts about eight, nine pounds. Anyway, and you see women do that in the cardio grind, and they finally, for whatever reason, get into wanting to push themselves and go heavier. And sometimes it's powerlifting or Olympic lifting, but it doesn't have to be, right? women pushing themselves in the 12 to 15 rep range 
and they'll make more they'll make more gains in two months than they made in two years. All of a sudden, because they're suddenly pushing themselves and starting to gain a little bit of muscle mass and tone or whatever you want to call it. Um, actually, there was a story, and it was a woman who bought into that three pound nonsense, and she had a kid, and suddenly noticed that the arm she was carrying her child in started to get more toned. <laughs> Wow. Just do the Milo thing, right? Just carry your kid every day as it gains weight. By the time it's right. <laughs> 130 pounds, you'll be, you'll be jacked and strong. But um, the, the issue that then comes up with women is some women have a big strength variance across their menstrual cycle, which we don't really have time to get into. But it, it can, that can make it proportionally. They may not be able to add weight in the same way. Women are also often limited by the fact that they're lifting lighter absolute weights makes the average gym implement almost unworkable, right? The average gym in the U.S., five pounds is the lightest you can add. Yep. Any car, you got a two and a half pound weight. Now, for a guy benching 225, that's two and a half percent. And for a woman benching 50 pounds, that's five percent, right? Now, the guy, sorry, 10 percent. The 225 pound bencher is probably not going to throw 25 pounds on the bar. Okay, if he's 17, he's going to throw 25. But you know what I mean. The guy who's, who's training, he's going to add 5 pounds and 5 pounds and 5. Women are often limited just because the, the weight implements go up to – dumbbells are a nightmare, right? Because yeah. go up – you might have two and a half, if you're lucky, up to 40 or 50 pounds. I mean, that can be a problem for dudes. Trying yeah. to go from 55 to 60 in the incline dumbbell press, you can't eat – you go from 55 for 8 to can't even start the damn thing off your chest. Yeah. Uh, and and women are far more limited, especially upper body more so than lower body, because it makes it, you know, and there's micro plates, which you can buy, I use those a lot, more so for bench press, right? I, I have to be able, even on a 150 pound bench, I got to be able to go up a pound or two at a time okay. uh, with Sumi. Squats, deadlifts, not so much, just because the numbers are, you know, at 200 pounds, not that big of a deal. I use them sometimes. Um you can magnet weights, which are semi-effective and super expensive. I've had people use uh, wrist weights, right, for pushing mm -hmm. movements. Get two yep. and a half pound wrist weights, and on a dumbbell press or overhead shoulder press, that will allow you to go up in much smaller increments. Women sometimes have to, you know, they can get whatever. 15 pounds for eight in an overhead dumbbell press, well, bump that up to 12 to 15 over time. Yeah. You can do 15 pounds for 15 reps. You can probably go to 20. You might get five or six, maybe eight in good form. Build it back. Like they, they may have fewer options in that regard. That's more of a practical issue than a physiological one, but it's one that's often not considered. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so like and you can get it all kinds of practical stuff, but the big physiological differences is more frequency, higher relative intensity, somewhat more volume, I think. Um, and that seems to be consistently what most people would, would agree with. Awesome. And that's probably a good transition to kind of wrap it up here. I wanted to mention the charity that we were doing oh, yeah. into for today, uh, the Billie Jean King. Uh, I think it's called like, the Women's Sports Foundation. So can you just briefly yes. explain why you chose that one? Um, so, you know, so I, after three and a half years of absolute nightmarish grinding, I, I finally published this woman's book, Volume One, because it got so long I had to split it up into two. And... The way this actually came about, like it, I'd been thinking of, of doing some sort of donations and like, and this will sound weird, but I get it. For some people, the idea of, of a male writing about female, like a lot of people are not, don't particularly care for that. And, and I do get that. But some of it was, came out of, joke is the wrong word. All right. Do you know, do you know the game uh, Cards for Humanity? Cards Against yeah. Humanity? Mm -hmm. Okay. A couple years ago, as a joke, they did the Cards Against Humanity pink box. And it's some of the funniest advertising writing I've ever seen in my life, right? All is the same game in a yeah. pink box. And mm -hmm. the advertising, like they would have the, the FAQ and it was stuff like, you know, what, what if I don't like this game? And it was just like, you know, that sort of classical pandering female. And it was like, oh, no, you're beautiful. You, you'll love this box. It'll look great <laughs> on you. Chia seeds. It was, it, was, it was absolutely brilliant because it was very subversive. <laughs> but they made it $5 more. Mm. And this is a, a, a joke on what's called the pink tax, right? There's the simple fact that in the modern world, most women's cosmetics, razors, things of that nature, they are last year's men's version, made pink, and they cost more, and they're more expensive. This is not a joke. Go Google the pink. It is a very serious thing, and there's a lot of uh, 
very rational blowback against this because it's it's I, I watched some piece about it and one of the marketing guys says yeah if we want to make a woman's version you shrink it and pink it and that's oh and so yeah women's razors are just pink versions of what men had one or two years ago hmm. at a higher cost and that's called the pink tax so cards against humanity did this and at the time, I, one of my good friends is a graph designer, and I was my cover was going to be an absolute disaster. And she says, I got an idea. She goes, make it bright pink, which I've actually had a couple people. I had one person who bought it tell me, this is the only pink thing I own, which I don't know if that's good or bad, but I was pretty happy about that. And because it is, it's it's slightly, but it, but I did that. And then, and then she said, because I've been thinking about maybe donating to like local sports team, like female or you know because let's face it female sports still not as as funded as well and her suggestion was look put this cover on there you know jokingly throw on a five dollar pink tax but donate that somewhere and so i looked around and i finally came came across the bill this billy jean king women's sports foundation and for younger listeners billy jean king was really a groundbreaker for women's sports she was a top tennis player in the 1970s mm -hmm. at a time when women's sports was still kind of a very new thing uh and there's sort of there was a classic story and they've done a movie of it that if you want there's this guy yeah, bobby steve riggs. carell well yeah and it's, he was it, the actor yeah, so. yeah and there's this guy named bobby riggs and bobby riggs was a huge loudmouth sexist who was like eh, Men can, women can't do anything better than men and challenge Billie Jean King to a tennis match. Like, a, And I'm sure it was a charity. I certainly hope it was a charity tennis match. Because he was like, he's a recreational tennis player, and he was convinced that he could beat this, this upstart woman. And she just stomped his little ass. Like, I, I was a little younger. I remember it happening. I don't think I watched it. And the Steve Carell movie, and I forget the female actress playing Billie Jean King. Regardless, she has been really a pioneer in women's sports. One of the early, and there, there were others, make no mistake. So she started this Women's Sports Foundation to do research to make sure that women's sports are funded. And that, they're a nonprofit, and that seemed like a good organization for me to make, to take that $5 joking pink tax I threw on there and donate mm -hmm. to. Um, and I was actually, they were, <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not going to like, I don't want it to be like, oh, I've, I donated and I'm cool and, and awesome. But I contacted them about this, you know, and I don't think they knew what they were expecting donation wise. But the first year that book sold it, like a lot of people bought it. And to all those people, thank you. Um, Cause it's not the easiest book to read. But when I made that donation, they were not expecting it to be in that amount. Yeah. And like you said, it's not, I'm not like trying to toot my own horn and go, oh, I, it, it was money that I made off of a commercial product and I felt that it was important um, to put some of that money back into what I was writing about. So that's, that's yeah, why. That's awesome. The Billie Jean Foundation, so. Cool, cool. So just to wrap up, a quick speed round. It's either yeah. one, one word or one sentence. Okay. All right. So uh, do you prefer training men or women? Um, women. De right. Definitely, I'll be honest, they tend to have a higher pain tolerance and they listen better. Cool. Uh, what is your favorite book that you've written? Oh, that I've written? Uh, stylistically, I'd say Ultimate Diet 2.0. It's probably the book that's the closest to my normal conversational style. Cool. And uh, if we set up a charity boxing match with you and somebody in the fitness industry, who's your opponent? Oh, good Lord. Everybody. <laughs> they they all, the world. They'd all They'd all want, yeah, they'd all want a piece of me. I can't, awesome. think, of, I can't think of any individual who dislikes me more specifically than the others. <laughs> At some point or another, I've probably shaped everyone's butt. So, so, uh, so you've got the Facebook group, um, the forums, which aren't as active, but they're still up. Uh, anywhere yeah. else people can find your stuff? Um, I mean, my, my website is bodyrecomposition.com. It will lead you to this. And I've got over 500 articles, stuff that I've written about. I mean, I've been around since the beginning. Um, my Facebook group is called also called Body Recomposition. It's probably where I'm most active. And one of the things I always like to point out is I learn from my group. I have a tendency to attract people that are experts in their own field. Um, we have a couple OBGYNs, a couple of outright physicians to excellent physiotherapists. Uh, I've got a guy who I believe has coached some of the top, couple of the top MMA guys, another guy's couple of the top strongman guys. Mm. People ask questions and if I can't field them, and usually it's pathophysiology or disease or, or various things, if I can't, 
We've got a couple of steroid experts, Chester Rockwell, Joe Jeffrey, Broderick Chavez is in there, Peter Bond, who most people have never heard of. He's written a book in Dutch about steroids. But if I can't address it, somebody else can. Any, it's amazing to me. Somebody will ask about some obscure one in 10,000 medical condition that I've never heard of. And I'll be damned. We have three people in the group that have it yeah. and know more about it. You know, you want to find an expert in something, find someone that suffered it. And I learn from my group daily because there are so many really, really, really smart people in there that have expertise that I don't. And so, like I said, if I can't answer it, one of them probably can. Cool, cool. All right, man. Well, thanks again so much for talking today. Absolutely. It's good. Thanks for having me.